Thank you, Matt and praise team, for uh, leading us again in worship as you do every week so faithfully. We really appreciate that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of uh, on cloud nine uh, from last Sunday. What such a great service. And for those of you who were here and saw that, um, how, I mean, how encouraging was that service? Um, five uh, individuals uh, took that step of obedience and uh, were publicly baptized, publicly confessed with their mouths that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. Uh, we had Boston and Cooper Boyke and Bridget Cottonwire and Tracy Nestor and, and uh, my son. And uh, it was such a, such a privilege for me to be able to share in that. And uh, you, you each uh, told your story, your, your testimony of what Christ has done for you. And let me just say this, you five who did that, um, this is incredible. After the service, I got a text from Amanda Cake. Amanda Cake and her boys watch faithfully every week. They're probably watching right now. If you are Amanda, we love you, and we're so thankful for you and your family. Um, but she texted me and said that her youngest son... After the baptisms, her youngest son, Daniel, came up to her and said, Mom, I don't have a story. I don't have a story, and I want a story. And he gave his life to Jesus Christ last Sunday because of, because of you guys, you five, stepping out and telling your testimony. So certainly something to clap about. And Amanda and Daniel, we are, we are rejoicing with you. So um, such good news. God, God is building his church. He is building this church. And I'm so excited what he has in store for us. All right, well, uh, last week I, I said we were going to kind of take a break from Acts 27. This week we're going to get right back into it. So get your Bible out. If you don't have one, there should be one in the pew in front of you. But you can turn to Acts chapter 27 this morning. We're going to finish this chapter today. And uh, it's, it's interesting, uh, during the past few weeks in our study on Acts, we've kind of been going through a series within a series. Uh, the main series, of course, is Acts, but all of chapter 27 has been about storms. Storms, which, let me just say real quick, Paul here is finally getting his wish. He's going to Rome, the most powerful, political, prominent, popular, prosperous city in the ancient world. Paul uh, has wanted to go there for years. Why? Um, to get the gospel into that city. See, everything at that time, everything went in and out of Rome. And so if Paul got the gospel into Rome, then Rome would get the gospel out to the ends of the earth. And so Paul's dream for years, his dream was to preach the gospel in Rome. And, you know, Paul's been to a lot of places. He really has. Palestine, Syria, Greece, Asia. He's logged a lot of miles, but Rome was number one on his bucket list, and in Acts chapter 27, he's on his way. He's finally on his way. Now, um, please keep in mind, Paul is going to Rome as a prisoner. He's going to Rome as a prisoner. He has spent over two years locked up in Caesarea for crimes he didn't commit, and none of the Roman officials knew what to do with Paul. They, they knew Paul was innocent, but if they let him go, the Jewish religious leaders who hated Paul, they would have rioted, and the Roman authorities did not want any civil unrest. And so after several mistrials, they ship Paul off to Emperor Nero in Rome. All right, So, you know, you're, you're Nero's problem now, Paul. And so Paul is sailing to Rome as a prisoner. His two friends, Luke and Aristarchus, they pretended to be Paul's servants so they could sail with him. Of course, there were other prisoners on board this ship as well. The majority of them were being sent to Rome to be executed. They would more than likely be forced to become gladiators where they would die in hand-to-hand -hand combat against elite Roman warriors, or they would be fed to lions before a, a, a watching, cheering crowd. Okay, so that, that covers the prisoners, but also keep in mind on this ship, obviously there was a captain and a crew presiding over the whole group was a centurion named Julius. A centurion, a Roman centurion, was a commander uh, of a hundred soldiers. And those hundred soldiers would have also been on board. So let's, let's tally it up, all up here. Julius, the hundred soldiers, the captain and crew, the prisoners, including Paul, Luke and Aristarchus. Acts 27-37 tells us that in all, there were 276 people on the boat. So this was a larger boat. 
It needed to be large in order to have enough food and supplies to sustain and support 276 people for over 2,500 miles. That's how far Rome was, was, was from Caesarea. And to sail that distance up and across the Mediterranean Sea, that should have taken five weeks, but this trip took almost five months. And that's because there was a storm which led to a shipwreck Paul and his companions ran into the storm about halfway into their trip. They were on the island of Crete at this harbor called Fairhavens when the weather started to turn. Of course, remember, Paul advised Julius not to go any further. Paul said, let's hunker down right here in Fairhavens until the storm passes. The captain and the crew wanted to go further, so they convinced Julius to leave Fairhavens, and that's when the storm grew into a nor'easter. They should have listened to Paul. And so for 14 days, they battled the wind and the waves. After 14 days, the storm blew them almost 500 miles off course to an island called Malta. Of course, at that time, Paul and the crew didn't know it was the island of Malta. They didn't even know they were nearing land because Acts 27.20 says that neither sun nor stars appeared for many days. Guys, this storm was so big and it was so dark that it blocked out the sun, moon, and stars. They had no way to navigate. They were just being driven along by the wind. And after two full weeks, in fact, verse 27 tells us that at midnight on the 14th day, they suspected they were nearing land. Again, they couldn't see the shore, but they could hear the surf. They could hear the waves crashing on the coastline. And so they're afraid that they're going to run aground on the rocks and then be swept out to sea. So they lower uh, the anchors to hold their, their ship in place. And the sailors, you remember, they try to sneak off the boat in that little life raft. And Paul sees what they're up to. He tells them, God's going to make sure that we all make it out of this alive, but we got to stick together. And so they all stay on the boat. Paul has everybody stop what they're doing, and he brings out some food. You remember this from two weeks ago? None of them had eaten in 14 days. They're exhausted. They're physically weak. And so Paul brings out some food. He gives thanks to God, and they start eating. And in verse 36 says that the crew were all encouraged by Paul. And, 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 and that's where we left off last time. And so for the last few weeks now, we've been talking about storms. You know, on a journey across the Mediterranean Sea on a, on a 2,500-mile boat trip, you're going to run into storms. And guys, on, on our journey, the, the years we put into our trip through life, we're going to run into some storms. We will experience difficulty. In John 16, Jesus said, In this world you will have trouble. In Job 14, 1, Job says, Man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. In Psalm 22, 11, David says, trouble is near. So, you know, the road signs on our trip could read, danger ahead, look out for falling rocks, uneven pavement. In this world, we will have trouble. Life is few of days and full of trouble. Trouble is near, and anybody who survived junior high would agree with that wholeheartedly. The storms of life, tribulation, trouble, trials. Some of us are in one right now. Some of us are nearing one as we speak. Some of us just got through one and it's in the rearview mirror. Well, catch your breath. Another one's coming. As David says, trouble is near. Which let me, let me just help you guys out with something really, really quick. Some of us, actually a lot of us, would say we're in a trial when what we're really experiencing is a consequence. See, there's a big difference between the two, and, and, and let's not confuse them anymore. Some people have made some seriously selfish, sinful decisions, and they've done the wrong they know they shouldn't do. God said don't, and they did, and so as a result, they've made a huge mess of their lives. And so some people will say, listen, you really need to pray for me right now. I am in a serious trial. No, you're suffering a consequence, not a trial. And so here's the difference between the two. We'll start with a consequence. A consequence is a difficulty caused by sin. 
And the purpose of a consequence is to move you to repentance, to get you to admit your sin and turn away from it, to admit it and quit it. A trial is much different. A trial is a difficulty caused by God. Okay, this is not something you caused because of sin. A trial is something God allows, and God allows trials into our lives in order to change who we are and what we do. James McDonald says, trials are intended to transform our conduct and our character. Conduct is what we do, and our character, that's who we are. All right, think of it like this. Consequences reform, they correct what's wrong, trials transform, they improve on what's right. Consequences bring us back to repentance, trials move us forward in our faith. Do, do you see the difference? Okay, let, let me just, to make sure you're, you're with me here, I'm going to give you some examples, and I want you to tell me if it's a trial or a consequence. Tell me trial or consequence. We've, we've done this exercise before. I'll, I'll start off with an easy one. Um, I've lost everything. Checking, savings, retirement, gone. I've lost it all because I can't seem to stay away from the casino. That's a consequence, right? You got a, you got a gambling problem. It's a consequence. Here's another one. My marriage is struggling because... My wife and I can never seem to resolve conflict, and so as a result, we have stayed mad at each other for years. Trial or consequence? Consequence. You've passed on forgiveness. You've allowed bitterness. Consequence. How about this one? My, my child is in the hospital. He fell on the playground at school. He can't move. The doctors aren't sure if his neck is broken. Trial or consequence? Trial, for sure a trial. I lost my job today because they were making cutbacks and I was one of the ones they cut. It's a trial. One more. I lost my job today because I stole a bunch of stuff from work. That's, that's a consequence. All right. So listen, we're talking about legit storms trials, suffering allowed by God to transform us. Don't confuse that with a consequence which is suffering caused by sin to reform us. Hopefully you understand the difference because when you do, when, when you can discern if what you're suffering is a consequence or a trial, you'll know how to respond. I said earlier that the correct response to a consequence is repent, stop, drop, and repent. Stop what you're doing, drop to your knees, and repent of your sin. Turn away from it. Now, if what you're suffering is a trial, how you respond to a trial is endure by faith. Go forward in faith. Keep walking by faith. Consequence, repent. Trial, remain. Keep trusting God. Continue obeying God. Like that, like that old hymn says, you know, trust and obey, for there's no other way. There's no other way. Guys, it's hard. I'm telling you right now, it's extremely difficult. If it, if it was easy to, to continue trusting God and, and obeying God in the storm, everybody would do it. Unfortunately, you and I are a lot like those sailors in Paul's boat who were trying to sneak onto the life raft. They were looking for the shortcut, the nearest exit, the easy way out. We do that, and yet the way out of a trial is through the trial. And that's going to take obedience. Obedience. It's going to take a whole lot of trust. And so what are some things, what are some truths we can cling to which will motivate us, encourage us, inspire us to keep trusting and obeying God through a trial, through a storm? Well, our text this morning is going to give us three answers to that question, three truths to cling to as we cling to God in a storm. Here's the first one. God's provision is always timely. God's provision... God provides, amen? Amen. God, God's provision is always timely. Look at verse 39. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land. So at, at midnight on the 14th day, they all suspected they were nearing land. Again, they couldn't, they couldn't see it, but they heard what they thought were waves breaking on the shoreline. But when it was day... They could see the land. You know, you can, almost, you can almost hear 
the person perched up in that little, that little bird's nest on top of the sail shouting, Land ho! Right? They saw land, but Luke tells us in verse 39 that they, they did not recognize it. They did not recognize it. Now, we, we can read ahead and clearly see that they were nearing the island of Malta, but in real time, nobody on the boat knew where they were. Remember, they were, they were being blown across the Mediterranean Sea by a nor'easter. They couldn't see the st- sun or the stars to navigate. They have no clue how far off course they were blown. The last place they were sure of was when they let down their anchors at the island of Clauda, which was some 500 miles east of where they are now. They did not recognize the land, Luke says. They had no clue they were near the island of Malta, which was roughly 425 miles south of Rome. You know, to travel that distance by plane, it would take about an hour and a half. By car, it would take 14 hours. By boat, it's going to take at least 17 hours. So they're not anywhere near their target. They're near Malta, not Rome. Now, Malta is an island about um, 15 miles long and 10 miles wide. Its, Its shoreline is littered with large, jagged rocks jutting out of the water. So not the easiest of islands to dock at. However, they did see a small clearing. Back to verse 39. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. Now I mentioned this two weeks ago. This bay that that Paul and the crew saw, today it's called St. Paul's Bay. Why? Because, Because this is the bay Paul is going to crash into. It's, it's been named after Paul because Paul was there, which means what we're reading this morning, this isn't fiction. You see, this really happened. This is historical. This is factual. This is non-fictional. This isn't loosely based or, or partly inspired by true events. No, these are the facts straight from the pen of an eyewitness Luke who was there on the boat, in the sea, during the storm. This is true. God's word is true. And and the word that Luke uses in Scripture, the word bay, in verse 39, they noticed a bay with a beach. That that word bay, the Greek word is kolpos. It means bosom. Think of it like this. Just as a baby clings to his mother when he's afraid or feels threatened, a baby finds comfort in his mother's bosom. And so these sailors on the boat being driven by the storm straight into the jagged rocks. Guys, this is not good. Something needs to happen fast, and just in the nick of time, they see this this sliver of sand, this beach, this sandy bay on Malta, and they were comforted. Let me ask you, did God see them in the storm? Did God know what they needed? Did God provide at the right time? One of my commentaries rightly points out that God himself steered that ship to that sliver of shore. See, guys, God's in control, and in His sovereignty, He will provide what you need when you need it. Does God see you in your storm? Does God know what you need? Will God provide it at the right time? You know, Philippians 4.19, Paul wrote this verse, Philippians 4.19. Maybe he had Malta in mind when he wrote it. He said, my God will supply every need. My God will supply every need. It was true then, and it's true now. How many of you here this morning have experienced answered prayer? Put up your hand if you've experienced answered prayer. Okay, how many of you this morning have had an urgent need met? At one time in your life, how many of you have had an urgent need met? How many of you, when you couldn't see a way, God made a way? You know, the storm was so dark and the clouds were so thick and you were so lost, but God led you through. How many of you have had that experience? How many of you, uh, a bill was due, you had no clue where the money was going to come from, but that bill got paid? How many of you have been in a bad place, a dark place? I'm talking hopeless, discouraged, depressed, But then you found a verse, or you got a phone call, or somebody sent you a letter, and it it brought you out of that pit. Anybody? Guys, I've experienced those more than once, and let me tell you, it wasn't just a coincidence. 
that I found a verse when I needed it the most or somebody called me up at just the right time or my in-laws sent me a check when Carrie and I had $12 to our name. Coincidence? Was it a lucky coincidence that right when Paul and his crew were about to crash into rocks and be swept out to sea that they see this nice sandy beach a few hundred yards from where they were? Is that a coincidence? That's God's provision. Not a coincidence. And God's provision is always timely. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 40. So they see this bay, this sandy beach, and they cast off the anchors and and left them in the sea. So, guys, they needed to lighten the boat. Okay, they needed to lighten the boat so it would ride higher on the water and run aground further up the beach. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea. And at the same time, verse 40 says, at the same time, loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. All right, the rudders were how they steered the boat. So in Paul's day, a boat this size would have been steered by two large paddles, and in a storm, those paddles would have been lifted up out of the water and secured to the side of the boat, but, but here, but here they, they needed to guide the boat into this bay. Okay, so they loosened the rudders and dropped them into the water. They threw up the anchors, they freed up the rudders, and they hoisted the sail. The end of verse 40 says, then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. Verse 41, but... See, guys, everything turns on that word but. Sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad. I'll give you, give you an example. Romans 6, 23, uh, first part of that verse says, for the wages of sin is death. Right? The wages of sin is death. Not great news. First of all, you're a sinner. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning to be told you're a sinner? You are, though. So am I. I've stolen and cheated and lusted and hated. I've gossiped and I've lied and I've been selfish and greedy and proud. I've done things I know I shouldn't do. I've refused to do things I know I should do. It's, it's all sin. I've sinned, you've sinned, and it is our sin that separates us from a holy God. Isaiah 59, 2, I, I read this verse last week. That verse says, your sins have made a separation between you and God. And, and not only does my sin separate me from God, but my sin puts me under God's wrath. You know about God's wrath? God's righteous, holy, burning anger towards sin. Do you guys understand? A holy God must punish sin or else he would not be holy. He wouldn't be righteous or, or, or just or even good if he didn't punish sin. And so the punishment I deserve for the sin I did, the punishment is death, spiritual death, eternal death, separation from God in hell forever and ever. See, that's what we deserve from God because of how we sinned against God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. That is a problem. It is a problem we cannot fix, change, or solve for the wages of sin is death. However, however, there's not a period after those words in Romans 6.23. There's more to it. Let me read the whole thing. For the wages of sin is death, but, again, everything turns on that word, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, what we all deserve for what we all did is death, but that's not the end of the story. Because God, in his love, sent his son to die for sin, and he rose again to give us new life. You see, the wages of your sin is death, but Jesus came and got what you deserved, death, so you can get what you could never earn, eternal life. It's a free gift, And all you have to do to make that gift yours is receive it by faith. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to purchase it. You don't have to earn it because then it would no longer be a gift. See, Jesus Jesus did the work through his death and sacrifice. Jesus purchased your salvation through the sacrifice of his life and the shedding of his blood. All you got to do is believe that Jesus is the only means by which you could be forgiven and saved and have eternal life. And if you haven't believed in Jesus for your salvation, will you today? Will you receive by faith the free gift of eternal life found only in Jesus Christ? Will you? How could you not, especially after what Romans 6.23 tells us? For the wages of sin is death, 
good news or bad news. It's the worst news. The wages of sin is death, but, you ready for some good news? But the gift of God, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Everything turns on that word but. And we see this so clearly in Acts 27. The sailors, they cast off the anchors. They they put the paddles in the water. They hoisted the sails. There's a beach within reach, full speed ahead. But, verse 41, but everything's going to turn. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable. And the stern was being broken up by the surf. So did things turn for the good or for the bad? The bad. The boat was stuck. The bow, the front of the boat, was hung up on a sandbar. The stern, the back of the boat, was being battered by the waves. Luke says that the stern was being broken up by the surf. That word broken, and and that verse means to be put under. So where was the ship going? Under. She was going down. Now, remember, Paul said this was going to happen. Paul said this would happen back in verse 22. Paul said to everybody on board, I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. See, Paul said the boat would sink, but the passengers would survive. None of them would be swept out to sea. None of them would go down with the ship. None of them would drown. They would be saved. And that's, and that's because just a short distance away was this nice, sandy beach. Lucky coincidence or timely provision. It was God's timely provision. In a storm, God's provision is always timely. Again, he sees where you are, he knows what you need, and he'll provide what you need when you need it. And I personally have no reason to doubt this or deny this because I have seen it play out in my life over and over again. And so have you. God has proven himself to be faithful time and time again, hasn't he? Hasn't he? And if you doubt God's timely provision, if you deny God's timely provision, then produce your strong reasons for why you do. Again, I have too many reasons not to doubt it or deny it. I have too many experiences where God knew exactly what I needed it and he provided when I needed it. Charles Spurgeon once said, I love this, he said, as for God failing you, as for God failing you, never dream of it. Hate the thought of it. The God who has been sufficient until now should be trusted to the end. See, God's provision has been sufficient. His provision is still sufficient. And His provision will always be sufficient. In a storm, God's provision is always timely. Here's the second thing. In a storm, God's providence is a certainty. God's providence is a certainty. So with the boat going under... It's time to abandon ship. Time to jump ship. Now this presented two problems to the soldiers on board. Two problems. Number one, they would need to swim. To stay alive, they would need to swim, which was scary enough. Paul said they wouldn't die, but in their minds, Paul was just a prisoner, so what did he know? Swimming was a risk. They could get sucked under by the current. They could be tossed onto the rocks by the waves. Problem number one, they had to swim. And problem number two, if the soldiers did manage to make it to shore safely and some of the prisoners escaped, those soldiers would have received the prisoners' punishment. And these prisoners, remember, they were going to Rome to be executed. According to Roman law, if a prisoner escaped, the soldier responsible for the prisoner, his life was now forfeit. None of these prisoners could escape or else the soldiers would pay for it with their lives. And since these prisoners would also jump ship and swim to shore, well, what if one or two of them got away? See, guys, if there were a if hundred prisoners on board, a hundred prisoners had to be delivered, dead or alive, or else the soldiers would make up the difference with their lives. Do you understand? So the soldiers' plan, look at verse 42, the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners lest any should swim away and escape. Can a dead prisoner escape? No, a dead prisoner can be accounted for. Now keep in mind, Paul here, was he a prisoner or a passenger? A prisoner. What were the soldiers planning on doing with Paul? Killing him. I just have to say, this is is quite the adventure for Paul. 
In a book I was, I was reading recently, it said, the secret of writing an adventure story is tension. The successful novelist must constantly have his hero in situations which seem impossible to escape. If the novelist delivers his hero from one threatening condition, he must involve his hero in another. Narrow escapes are the stuff of which stories are made. I like that. But guys, keep in mind, what we're reading today isn't just some story. Okay, and Luke isn't just some, some adventure fiction novelist. This is real. Luke's an eyewitness. This is true life. And sometimes true life is crazier than an adventure story. And so right here, Paul, the hero, he is spared from one threatening condition, the sea, only to be involved in another threatening condition, the soldiers. They were going to kill Paul and the other prisoners before jumping overboard. But, verse 43, but, guys, everything's going to turn on this word. But the centurion, what's his name? Julius, notice what Julius does, but the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept the soldiers from carrying out their plan. Now, here's the thing. and Let's just think about this. Paul had found favor in Julius' eyes. Again, Julius was the centurion. He was the soldier's commanding officer. Paul got on his good side. Way back in verse 3, we're told that Julius treated Paul kindly. Okay, at first, it may have been for selfish reasons. I, I mentioned earlier that Luke and Aristarchus pretended to be Paul's servants in order to get on the boat with him. And so Julius may have thought that Paul, even though a prisoner, he was wealthy. And perhaps Julius was trying to bribe Paul for money by treating him nicer than the other prisoners. I don't know. All I do know is that throughout this trip, Julius had grown to respect Paul. And it, it wasn't because of how awesome Paul was. Julius respected the kind of man God had shaped Paul to be. You see, God had given Paul wisdom, and, and Paul's God-given wisdom impressed Julius. How, how do we know Paul was wise? Well, because Paul was the only one who advised them not to leave Fair Havens. In verse 10, Paul said, sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss. Paul was right. He was wise. God had made Paul wise. God had given Paul strength, and Julius was impressed with Paul's God-given strength. Verse 20 tells us that everybody on board the boat had at last abandoned hope of being saved. Everybody caved but Paul. And in verse 22, Paul, Paul stands up and he says, I urge you to take heart. In verse 25, Paul says, take heart, men. Paul was strong. God had made Paul strong. God had given Paul a promise. And, and Julius was impressed with Paul's God-given promise. In verse 23, look at that with me. Verses 23 and 24. Here's the promise Paul received from God. Paul says to the crew, for this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Paul received the promise. Paul believed the promise. And that promise relieved the crew. Julius was impressed. God had shaped Paul into a man who led by example. Julius really liked that. Paul recognized that the crew needed to eat after 14 days of fighting the storm. These guys were starving. I mean, think about it. They were already scared. They were for sure tired, and now they're hungry. It's not a good combination. You know, you're not you when you're hungry, according to the people at Snickers. And so Paul knows they need to eat. Food will give them strength, so he leads by example. In verse 35, verse 35, it says that Paul took bread in giving thanks to God in the presence of all. He broke it, and he began to eat. He set the example, and notice the effect it had, verse 36. Then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. God had developed Paul into such a good leader. John MacArthur says, leaders do not push people from behind. They lead them from the front. They lead by example. So notice God's providence on display here. God had made Paul the man he was. God made him wise and strong. God gave Paul the ability to lead, which impressed the Roman centurion whom God had placed on Paul's boat. 
God also gave Paul a promise to share with the centurion and the captain, the soldiers and the sailors and the prisoners. The promise was, Paul, you're going to stand before Caesar and to the crew. The promise was, there will be no loss of life among you. But now the soldiers are threatening the promise. What was their plan? Guys, let me ask you, what was their plan for the prisoners, the soldiers? What was their plan? Kill them all. So if Paul would have died, he would not have stood before Caesar and God would be a liar. And if the prisoners would have died, they would not have made it to shore and God would be a liar. Is God a liar? Hebrews 6.18 says that it's impossible for God to lie. So then how is Paul and the rest of the prisoners, how are they going to make it out alive? God's providence is how. Again, God had transformed Paul into a man worthy of respect, and one who respected Paul was a man named Julius, and God had given Julius the position of centurion. God had given him command of a hundred soldiers, and those soldiers were on Paul's boat, and they wanted to kill Paul and the other prisoners, which would have nullified God's promise, but God had placed the soldier centurion on Paul's boat, and the centurion, verse 43, look at that, the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. Do you see how, how in control of everything God was? God orchestrated everything. He shaped Paul into a great leader. He gave Paul favor in Julius' eyes. He gave Julius command of a hundred soldiers. God put Julius and those soldiers on Paul's boat. And when the soldiers wanted to kill Paul and the prisoners, God put Julius in the middle and stopped them. God did it all. Again, verse 43, the centurion wishing to save Paul. So, that was the, so the first part of God's promise was preserved. Paul, you must stand before Caesar. God was making sure that it was going to happen exactly as he said. Back to verse, 20, verse 43, the centurion wishing to save Paul kept the soldiers from carrying out their plan. The second part of God's promise was preserved. There will be no loss of life among you. God was making sure that it was going to happen exactly as he had said. Guys, all God's providence means is God is orchestrating everything to accomplish his perfect plan. God is working out all things, all things according to his perfect will. Let me repeat that. God in his providence is working out everything exactly according to his plan. God works out all things according to his perfect will, Ephesians 1.11. So whatever happens, whatever form your storm takes, however long your storm lasts, no matter how severe your storm is, listen to me, God's providence is such that he can and he will make that storm fit perfectly into his plan for you. You know, the storm in Acts 27 could not stop God from accomplishing his plan for Paul's life. The soldiers in Acts 27 could not stop God from accomplishing his plan for Paul's life. No storm or problem, no soldier or person, nothing and no one can stop a sovereign God from accomplishing his purpose and his plan. That's God's providence. So let me, let, me, let, me, let me put this to you in today's uh, terms. No pandemic and no politician can stop a sovereign God from accomplishing his plan. In fact, God is so sovereign, his providence is such that he will see to it that every pandemic and every politician fits perfectly into his sovereign plan. I've said this before, I'll say it again, God wins. What are you worried about? What are you afraid of? I've read the end of the book. God wins, God wins, God wins. And if you're on his side, you win too. So in a storm, are, are you in one right now? Are you in a storm? If so, take heart. God's provision is always timely. God's providence is a certainty. And number three, God's promise will become a reality. God's promise will become a reality. So again, let's think, let's think about God's promise. In verse 22, verse 22, it says, there will be no loss of life among you. And then in verse 24, God has granted all those who sail with you, Paul. So the promise, all of you are going to survive this storm. You're going to live. Now, at the time the promise was given... Uh, the storm was still raging. Verse, verse 22 and verse 24, that's the promise given. 
But verse 27, so this is after the promise is given. Verse 27, look at that. It says, when the 14th night had come, we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea. Look, look at verse 29. Again, this is after the promise was given. And fearing that we might run on the rocks. Skip down to verse 41. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground, the bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. So, so at the time the promise was given, did the storm stop? Did the situation improve? Yes or no? No, it got worse. See, sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. Like, like the saying goes, uh, the night is darkest just before the dawn. And you cannot take a situation getting worse as proof that God's a liar and his promises can't be trusted. Don't do that. Don't do that. Have you ever thought, have you ever thought that the bigger the storm or the harder the trial, the greater the victory? Have you ever thought that? Maybe it's got to get really bad, really dark in order for you to finally see that God is big enough and strong enough and powerful enough to pull off an incredible victory. Not just a victory, but an incredible victory. And I'm telling you, a big, dark storm provides God with just that opportunity. See, God doesn't just want to win. He wants to win big. God wants to win in a way that demonstrates the power of who he is. But in the meantime, you got to trust what he says. His word, his promise, trust it. You know, God's word, it's full of promises. It's full of promises. I don't know the exact number. I found, I found two websites this week that said that God has made 7,487 promises. Another website said that God has made 5,467 promises. I have no idea, but I do know there are a lot of promises. And the book of Hebrews says that, that God's promises are great and precious. The book of Proverbs says that every word of God proves true. The book of Jeremiah says that God watches over his word to perform it. And the book of Matthew says that God's word will never pass away. Remember that when you receive God's promise because sometimes there's a little bit of space, there's a little passage of time between when the promise is given and when the promise becomes a reality. There's, there's that little space there. See, God told Paul and the crew, you're not going to die in this storm. That promise was given in verse 22. But then the storm gets worse in verse 27 and the boat breaks into pieces in verse 41. Does this mean God's a liar and his promise won't come true? No, every word of God proves true because God watches over his word to perform it. So get this settled in your mind. God, in time, your promise will become a reality. In time. Notice this in our text, back to verse 43. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. So, so Julius told the crew to abandon ship. So he ordered the soldiers to unshackle the prisoners and they all jumped overboard. Those who could swim led the way. Those who couldn't swim because the boat was breaking up so quickly, they were able to float to shore on, on pieces of broken boards. And so it was, look at the end of verse 44, Luke writes, and so it was that all were brought safely to land. John Phillips, I, I love how he describes the scene. We, we can almost picture it. Listen to this. The cries, the wild waves picking up the crew and wreckage alike and hurling it all on shore. We can see the curling of the waves, the foaming of the sea. We can see the struggling people plunge beneath the water, then emerging a little nearer to land. We can hear the cries of fear give way to a note of hope as at last their feet touch the sandy bottom. Then another wave picks them up again, overwhelms them, but throws them further towards the beach. Finally, the strong would wade back into the breakers to give a hand to the weak. Then came the roll call in the grateful realization that everybody was saved. They would stand there for a moment watching the waves pound the ship to shreds, grateful for their lives and devoutly thankful to feel solid ground beneath their feet at last. Guys, I love the part. Then came the roll call in the grateful realization that everybody was saved. I love that part. Listen, how many people, how many people were on the boat when it went down? 276, 
How many people made it to shore? 276. All survived just as God promised. The promise became a reality. The promise held true. God's word proves true. But again, it, it doesn't always happen immediately or instantly or automatically. Of course, of course, we want it to happen now. I mean, we want it to happen now, but a lot of times, most of the time, it happens later. These sailors had to endure two weeks of terror before they made it to shore. It, it wasn't, here's the promise, now make it a reality. That's not how it works. Again, in verse 22, the promise is given. Verse 22, there will be no loss of life among you. But it wasn't until verse 44 that the promise became a reality. Verse 44, all were brought safely to land. Now, in between, in between, there will be no loss of life among you, and all were brought safely to land. In between that was a shipwreck. Guys, what, what do we need to do? What do we need to do in that difficult space between the promise given and the promise becoming a reality? Verse 25 is what we need to do. Verse 25 is in between verse 22 and verse 44. It tells us exactly what to do in between the promise given and the promise becoming reality. So look at that verse, verse 25. Paul says, take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. How do we get through that valley between the promise given and the promise actually received? How do we get through? Listen, we, we walk by faith. That's what we do. That's how we get through. We walk by faith. We say what Paul said, I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. Can we trust God to do what he says? Can we trust God to stay true to his word? Can we trust God to make good on his promise? Let me ask you, hasn't God come through for you before? Hasn't God answered your prayers before? Hasn't he met your needs before? Hasn't God been so good to you before? Hasn't God been faithful to you before? Hasn't God blessed you abundantly before? Does God change? I, the Lord God, do not change, Malachi 3, 6. He's the same today, uh, yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13, 18. So if God has stayed true to who he is and what he said until now, then can't he be trusted today, tomorrow, forever? Again, in the words of Spurgeon, as for God failing you, never dream of it. Hate the thought of it. The God who has been sufficient until now should be trusted to the end. God should be trusted, God can be trusted, God must be trusted because guys, when you're, when you're in a storm and your ship is smashed up on the rocks and it's going under, who else do you got? Who else do you got? Who else can do what God can do? Who else can offer what God can offer? Who else can be who God is? Answer, no one. God provides, and God's provision is always timely. God is providential, and his providence is a certainty. God makes promises, and his promises will become a reality. But until then, have faith in God that it will be exactly as you have been told. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for how it challenges us. Thank you for how it encourages us. God, I'm just blown away week in and week out by how relevant your word is to what we're facing in our lives currently. God, the fact of the matter is we need your word, not just on Sundays, not just on Wednesdays, but every day of the week because a storm can come at any time. And God, I thank you for how your word just refreshed us this morning, how it reminded us that you will provide. You have provided, you are providing, you will provide, and that provision is sufficient, it is timely, God, I thank you for being a God who is providential, a God who is sovereign. You are in complete control, and you have said in your word that you will take all things, 
Good things, bad things, in between things, he will take all things and work them out for our good in your glory. And God, I thank you that in the meantime, as we're waiting, we have some incredible promises to cling to. Your word is full of them. May we grab onto them, hold tight, walk by faith, believing that it will be exactly as you have said. Thank you for the encouragement this morning. Thank you for our Savior, Jesus. It's in his name we pray.